Welcome to the Why Behind the Buy, a podcast for marketers focused on finding and targeting their ideal customers at scale. I'm your host, Monique Ruiz, and we're excited to bring you a special episode in honor of Black History Month. As you probably know, February marks the annual dedicated celebration of the achievements of African Americans and provides an opportunity for us to recognize the role they play in shaping U.S. history, culture, and for marketers, the economy. As part of Claritas' new American Mainstream series, we've just launched the 2020 African American Market Report, a look into the changing face of this consumer market. This report dives deep into the population growth of the Black segment with insights into household income, consumer spending within key categories, media preferences, and more. Over the next 20 minutes or so, we'll be talking about what that means for marketers like you. I have two new experts that I'll be speaking to today about the African-American market, including Tayana Robinson, a DC-based makeup artist and beauty educator turned business coach. First up, though, is Ron Cohen, VP of Practice Management here at Claritas. He was instrumental in creating this report, so he knows the data like the back of his hand. Plus, he's one of the leading experts on multicultural audiences at Claritas. Ron, thank you for joining me on the Why Behind the Buy. Hi, Monique. Thanks for having me. Of course. Just to give our listeners a little bit of background into your areas of expertise, since it's your first time on the podcast, how would you describe what you do in your role at Claritas? I'm now VP of Practice Leadership, uh, responsible for the multicultural practice within Claritas, which would include thought leadership pieces like the African American Market Report. Great. So, Ron, I want to start this episode off with a few basics. When it comes down to numbers, what are we looking at with regards to the African-American market? Well, our AMDS database shows the black population around 42 and a half million. That's uh, just over 12% of the U.S. population. Okay. However, only around 85% of the black population in the U.S. are what we would call African-American. The rest are African or of Caribbean origin, Jamaicans, for example. Very interesting. Still the, still the majority with that last figure, but I wouldn't have known that nearly 16% number. Uh, are, are those numbers significant in a way that might not be apparent to someone hearing them in this context of overall population? Well, multicultural Americans account for about 38% of the population today, and Blacks account for about a third of them. And of course, if you've been listening at home to our podcast over the last few months, or if you've seen some of the reports or other insights we've released, you'll know that the opportunity segment falls almost entirely within multicultural groups. So that's definitely something those of you listening would want to take note of. Right. White non-Hispanics still make up the largest segment of the population Mm -hmm. in the U.S., just under 60 percent. But their growth is declining, both in terms of absolute numbers and as a percentage of the total population, while multicultural segments of the population continue to show growth and therefore represent an opportunity for marketers looking to expand their market share for the mid to long term. Let's get into that more because I feel that's a fact that still hasn't quite sunk in for some brands in terms of knowing where the opportunity lies. The African-American market report that we're talking about today shows that the black population skews younger with more than half falling into the millennial and Generation Z buckets. What does that mean to a marketer? Well, for one thing, it means a higher lifetime value as a result of longer remaining lifespans, among other things. The data show that Also, in some categories, black households spend more on average than other households. I saw some data in the report sourced from Nielsen that the total U.S. ad expenditure was at $240 billion last year, which was up nearly $20 billion from the previous year. Yet advertisers were spending a total of 5% less on black focused media between 2017 and 2018. And media spend that was designed to reach black consumers decreased year over year in all areas. So why is that? Yeah, that's hard to say without talking to them, but on the surface, it would suggest that corporate America has imperfect knowledge of the value of marketing to blacks and the effect it can have on their bottom line. Hopefully, our report will help shift this in the right direction. I agree. 
In fact, the black consumer segment alone represents $1.3 trillion in annual buying power, right? Yes, according to Nielsen, uh, buying power is an indication of spendable income. So gross income, net income, after taxes and other deductions. We estimate actual consumer spending by black households to be around $800 billion per year. And knowing that, what are some of those categories that blacks are spending their money on? Well, the top items uh, blacks bought online last year were clothing and accessories. In other words, they were more likely to buy clothing and accessories online than, than other population segments. Mm. But something that stood out to us in the data is the fact that they also over-index for buying things like insurance and wine online. Mm. And the average black household spends more on categories like men's and boys' footwear and fresh fruit juice and, and other categories than, than average households. Ah, fruit juice. Yes, we always had orange juice in my fridge growing up, so I can give a personal testimony to that one. Something that wasn't included in this report, but can be found in an infographic we released last year using our own Energy Behavior Track original research, was that 29% of U.S. households are willing to go to a seminar to learn about life insurance products, which isn't that high of a number, but might still be surprising that seminars are still a viable way to reach consumers. So that being said, if you looked at that 29% by segment, 40% of that makeup were African-American households. So hearing that they buy insurance online makes sense to me too. Yeah, that's a good point, Monique. Our data indicate that people that tend to do more research on products and services before they buy Hmm. also tend to be more likely to purchase online. Okay. What I want to talk about now is where there are high populations of African-Americans. Basically, where is the opportunity? And not just any opportunity, but some that you might not necessarily think of. So if you think of the top DMAs in the U.S. for high concentrations of African-American households, there are probably a few that come to mind. D.C., Atlanta, Detroit, etc. But what about Columbus, Ohio or Little Rock, Arkansas? Did you know that about 20% of Little Rock and almost 14% of Columbus, Ohio identifies as African-American? And for context, Little Rock is the 58th most populous DMA and Columbus is the 33rd. Knowing this information, what does that mean? How can you turn those insights into action? Well, actually, Monique, I did know that. but Okay. <laughs> because my head is filled with such useless trivia. <laughs> <laughs> The, the trick is is to find markets with both a large presence mm-hmm. and a high concentration of your target group. There's only four U.S. TV markets with black population of more than a million where that group comprises more than 20% of the total population. The three you mentioned and Miami. Philadelphia is close, just under 20% black population. And markets like Baltimore and Raleigh-Durham have very high percentages of black population, but they come in at just under a million. After those, you have to find markets like the ones you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, Once you know where your target audience is located, then you can dig deeper into what they like and don't like and what their habits and preferences are. For example, uh, blacks in Little Rock might prefer Dodge cars, uh, whereas blacks in Columbus uh, tend to prefer Volkswagens. So you can adjust your ad mix to spend where the dollars will go further. AKA smarter targeting, smarter planning, and smarter buying, something we're all about around here when it comes to helping you find your best customers. So I think we can get into this a little bit more actually, but before we do, how about we take a quick commercial break? When we come back, we have a special guest joining us, Tayana Robinson, founder of Makeup Mogul University. This episode of the Why Behind the Buy has been all about the African-American market here in the United States. If you're interested in more in-depth insights into the changing face of this consumer market, then download our newest report today for free. Visit www.claritas.com slash 2020 African-American market. We'll make sure to leave that link in the description box of this episode on whichever platform you've chosen to listen to us on so you can navigate there easily. Again, that web address is www2, the number two, dot claritas.com slash 2020 African American Market. We're back and I'm so excited to introduce Tayana Robinson, a makeup artist turned beauty educator and business coach, who is also the founder of Makeup Mogul University, the world's first online business school exclusively for makeup artists. Tayana, welcome to the Why Behind the Buy. 
Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be a part of this episode in particular because I'm really, really excited to chat all about Black women and beauty and how they converge and how brands can better kind of market themselves to Black consumer in 2020 and beyond. I love it. So I know I just gave you a quick introduction, but I'd love it if you start us off in your own words as to who you are and how you ended up where you are today. Yeah. So my name is Tayana. I am a full-time professional makeup artist in DC. And my journey in beauty started when I was a little kid. Um, (laughs) Some of my earliest memories are of playing in my grandmother's blush, right? So (laughs) beauty has always kind of been a part of my life. And in fact, I thought that when I went to college that I would be a cosmetic chemist. So even though I didn't end up becoming a cosmetic chemist, I did end up uh, having a career in marketing and sales before becoming a makeup artist. And in that capacity, I lived in Cambodia, worked for a small startup hair extensions brand. Mm. And it was in that capacity that I really learned all about branding and positioning a luxury beauty brand specifically targeted at women of color and how to use social media to build a community around the brand. That's great. And as a side note to what you just said, just a little quick fact, Black shoppers spend nearly $500 million a year on hair care. So if you didn't know that, now you do. (laughs) But when you first started in the beauty industry, you found, uh, you mentioned it, you found a lack of makeup artists that catered to women of color in the DC area in particular, since that's where you're located, despite it being one of the top DMAs in the country for Black population growth. So was this an issue that you saw just locally? locally, or was it more across the board? And what were you finding from both the client side and your end as a quote unquote service provider? Yeah, you know, surprisingly, it's um, not just an issue that's specific to DC. I think it's across the board. But I think what was most surprising to me was to find that lack in DC specifically, because it does have such a high demographic Right. But how did how did you find products that worked for your business and your clientele? Were there marketing campaigns that you saw that kind of resonated with you? Was it a little bit of trial and error with brands that you were maybe already familiar with? Or was there some other way that you went and you actually found products to use to service your luxury clients? So it was like trial and error, lots of YouTube. YouTube was another resource that I relied on heavily, not only to improve my skill, but also to see kind of what were beauty enthusiasts that looked like me, that were doing the kind of makeup that I wanted to do. What were they using and talking about in their video? So it was that, it was, you know, seeing what my colleagues were using, my own trial and error. And it, you know, became this kit that has been customized to my clients' needs. Yep, that makes sense. And again, throwing out some facts there. So Black women spend nine times more on beauty and hair care than white women, for example. And then you mentioned um, looking to YouTube to find out some information. And a stat that I found on Forbes is that 92% of makeup users get information on beauty products from influencers' YouTube videos. So brands are kind of having to evolve their formula in this cost-effective way to reach consumers. And they're finding a much higher ROI by using platforms like this and working with influencers who then go on YouTube and have their videos showing a product and introducing it to people who would then go out and buy it. Yeah. And I think part of that is because when you look to a platform like YouTube or like Instagram, which is another big one that I know a lot of women go to for research when it comes to uh, hair and beauty products, you follow these people and they become like your girlfriends. So, you know, we often look to our girlfriends for recommendations for products and um, we've built those relationships with the influencers that we follow. So influencer marketing is definitely a great route to go as a brand that's looking to, you know, directly speak to their clientele Mm -hmm. because there is that trust factor. And we all know that people are people and we want to buy from brands that we know, like, and trust. And the thing or the people that kind of bridge that gap is influencers. I think if you speak to any Black woman, we all have the experience of, you know, getting our hair done by our moms and sitting in the kitchen and getting our hair pressed out or braided. Our presentation, the way that we show up in the world. Also, if we look at it from a historical context, it really kind of was a safety, like a safety thing, right? Like when we showed up in the world and we were presentable, we no longer were a threat. So when we think about, you know, the 50s and 60s, it really was a big 
big deal that we looked a certain way and we looked polished because otherwise we might be subject to discrimination and or violence. That's a very good point. I hadn't even thought about that. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I don't think that some of the, the folks that will be listening to this episode have probably thought of themselves and they have to keep that in mind if they want to reach their consumers, whoever their consumers are in a responsible way. It's knowing what they're interested in, but it's also knowing a little bit of that history. So you originally started out kind of focusing your services in marketing towards women of color. So how did you know where to find your customers? Did you do any type of specific research since you do have that marketing background? Or did you have certain tools at your fingertips that kind of led you down the right path? Yeah, what I realized pretty early on was that a lot of customers, especially when they're looking for a beauty service Mm -hmm. or a beauty product, is that they tend to use tools like Instagram as another Google. So I knew that as a service provider, I could simply think about what my client would be using, the terms that they would be using to search for a makeup artist. And I use those terms as as hashtags. Mm -hmm. So for example, I knew that a bride to be that was looking for a makeup artist in DC might open up her Instagram app and search for hashtag DCMUA or hashtag DC makeup artist. So I just constantly made sure that my content were in those streams so that when my client was looking for me, I would be the one that would be found. So yeah, I was really, really strategic in that way and started by thinking like my customer and working my way backwards. Mm -hmm. So it's like taking that SEO and bringing it to social media, basically. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so you've now kind of shifted your focus to building your brand as a makeup mogul, a beauty educator, and a business coach. So you're very busy. (laughs) Uh, Do you still... (laughs) <laughs> Do you still cater mostly to helping like clients that are interested in serving the underserved, which we would call women of color or black women, or have you kind of gone a different direction altogether? Like what was the driving force behind your decision to move forward in the way that you have now? Yes. So I started Makeup Mogul University last year. And again, just like when I started doing makeup and I was filling a need that existed, I looked at my colleagues in the industry and saw how they were really kind of struggling to market their own businesses. And I had people who would approach me and see all the things that I was doing and ask for tips and help. And so um, I wanted to create a resource that uh, makeup artists and beauty pros can go to to really get the answers and the support that they need in order to grow their businesses. I love that. And a kind of a want to give you a clap because you're helping to bring other females out there into the world of business and making them helping them on their entrepreneurial journey. And I just want to throw in another stat because you know I'm all about those stats, but uh, I love this was, it. I'm learning so much. <laughs> <laughs> this is a nod to a report that American Express actually put out back in I think it was 2018. So report said that half of all women-owned businesses are concentrated in three different categories. And one of those categories is what they're calling, quote unquote, other services, which beauty related businesses fall under. And so that's the number one category. So you're helping to build that category with the women that that you market to and that you work with. So from your experience, and then understanding, obviously, that the US is becoming even more of a melting pot where traditional, quote unquote, minorities now actually represent the majority of population growth, especially in larger cities, do you think that there's still really a need to kind of tailor your marketing to certain consumer segments like African-Americans, for example? And why why not? I think it absolutely is of the utmost importance. I think that that's just good marketing, period. I think that micro-targeting is the way of the future, especially now that we've got such powerful targeting tools through platforms like Facebook, Instagram, even Google, YouTube. I mean, there are all of these platforms that make micro-targeting so much more easy and cheaper than ever. So it's really smart to segment your marketing according to who you're marketing to, because at the end of the day, regardless of race, uh, ethnicity, Mm -hmm. gender, people want to be able to see themselves in your product and your service. And I think you'll find, like, if you were to do tests on um, your marketing campaigns, I think you will find that Black folk in particular will respond more enthusiastically to uh, marketing campaigns that reflect who they are. Mm -hmm. And you'll also find that Black consumers are very, very loyal because once we find a brand that we love and that speaks to us, it's hard for us to let let them go. (laughs) 
And you just mentioned brands, but some research from Nielsen shows that African-American consumers are over 40% more likely to interact with brands on social media or use social Mm -hmm. media to support companies and brands. So what, what platforms do you find work best for you? Yeah. So Instagram is number one, hands down. That's where uh, the beauty party typically is. Um, But I know that I speak to a demographic that is typically between 24 to 45 is the, my typical client. Mm -hmm. Facebook is number two for me, but I definitely would say Instagram is, is number one. Yeah. And that, that matches what our data says. So (laughs) a validation point right there. All right. Let me ask you this. If you could give any single piece of advice to marketers looking to expand their campaigns to better reach and serve African-American consumers in a responsible way, what would that be and why? I would say my number one advice is to have Black people not only at the table, but as decision makers, as you're planning and executing your marketing campaigns, because that languaging that you use is so important. How you position what you do and what you're offering is so important. We We can smell pandering from a mile away, right? We want authentic authentic marketing messages that are inclusive and not essentially just corporate blackface. That's not going to work. I think that's great advice and very important. So I have one more question for you before we wrap up our discussion today, and it's been great. So thank you again for coming on. So what's next for your business and where can those that are listening to this episode actually follow along your journey at? So my my baby is Makeup Mogul University. Um, that is definitely my number one focus. And I have a mission of helping a thousand beauty pros in 2020 make this their best year in business yet. But if you want to hang out with me and be a part of my beauty party, I am on Instagram at Tiana Robinson Beauty. Well, Tiana, thank you so much again for coming on the Why Behind the Buy, and uh, I look forward to following you along on your journey. Thank you so much. All right, Ron, it's back to just you and I now. So I want to ask you a few more questions about the African-American consumer market in the U.S. before we wrap up today's podcast. Before my interview with Tiana, we were talking about opportunity in two specific DMAs that have a high population of Black consumers to see how similar they are to one another and how different they are. I think that would be a good perspective for marketers who might still be using that quote-unquote one-size-fits-all approach to help them understand better as to why that's not the right direction to go. When you think of the Little Rock, Arkansas, and Columbus, Ohio DMAs, you may not immediately consider them to have large Black populations, but like I mentioned earlier, they do. And if we look at the attitudes and behaviors of Blacks in these two geographies, we see they're similar, but just different enough that you might tailor your marketing to them with adjusted messaging, offers, or even deciding where you engage them. For example, Blacks in Columbus and Little Rock are both more likely than the average household to believe that brands in ads are of a better quality than brands that aren't in ads. But Blacks in Columbus believe this more strongly than those in Little Rock. Another example, Blacks in Little Rock are less likely to expect brands they buy to support social causes than Blacks in Columbus. And they aren't as keen on receiving coupons on their cell phones based on their location. Ron, knowing details like this means what to a marketer? Well, if you were marketing to blacks in both geographies, you might decide to send text coupons for your products to blacks in Little Rock, and and you might distribute uh, them through email or some other method in Columbus. Uh, Or your ads to blacks in Columbus might feature some of the sustainability aspects of your products, whereas your ads to blacks in Little Rock might focus on other selling points. Or you might consider further segmenting your messaging as both of these attitudes are more related to generation than race. Millennials and Gen Z are far more concerned about sustainability and far more receptive to digital coupons than members of older generations across all races and ethnicities. It's those little nuances that could potentially mean the difference between a sale and a loss to a competitor, right? Absolutely. So I think this is probably a good place to sign off for today's episode. But before we do, we heard an answer from Tiana earlier. But if you can give any single piece of advice to marketers looking to expand their campaigns to better reach and serve African-American consumers in a responsible way, what would that be and why? 
Well, it's easy for me to say, but I would recommend offering products and services designed for African-American consumers rather than just adapting the messaging to reach them. You certainly want to take media preferences into account when messaging any target group, and that certainly includes African-Americans. But African-American consumers are savvy enough to know what products appeal to them and which Mm -hmm. ones don't. We can help identify which products those are, but even a well-planned messaging campaign will struggle to sell the wrong products to African-American consumers today. Great answer. All right, though, I, th- I want to thank my guests for today's episode, Ron Cohen and Tiana Robinson, but especially those of you listening to us at home and on the go. As always, if you haven't already, we would love for you to subscribe to The Why Behind the Buy so you never miss an episode. Rate us five stars, share with a friend, and leave us a positive comment. If you liked what you heard today and want to learn more about the African-American market, visit www.claritas.com slash 2020 African-American market to download your copy of our brand new report or continue the conversation with us over on our social channels. You'll see some of the data we talked about in today's episode, plus a ton more we couldn't get to. Bye now.